Welcome everyone to an event of the American Tarot Association featuring Dr. Joshua Canzona. The American Tarot Association's mission is to build on and advance the work and thought of Pierre Tarot de Chardin, and we are so grateful that you can be with us tonight. So now to introduce our presenter tonight, Dr. Canzona, I would like to introduce to you the president of the American Tarot Association, Sister Kathleen Duffy. So thank you, Andrew. It's now my, my ple pleasure and my privilege to present this evening's guest lecturer, Dr. Can Joshua Canzona. Josh is not a stranger to the American Tayard Association. He has been a valuable member of our board for several years and is not only chair of our events committee, but is also a member of the editorial board of our publications committee and belongs to several ad hoc committees. Dr. Josh Kenzona holds a doctorate in theological and religious studies from Georgetown University. He has taught at the Wake Forest University School of Divinity and presently serves at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, as ombudsman and university educator, committed to bringing people together across perceived distances. Josh's research and teaching focus on religious literacy, comparative theology, and the Muslim Christian dialogue with specialties in mysticism, religion and science, and religion and art. In his ombudsman role, he is part of a team offering workshops and individual coaching on effective communication strategies and constructive conflict management to a higher education constituency exceeding 40,000 community members. Josh has a sustained interest in the importance of honoring different ways of knowing and examining how we can positively transform and become positively transformed by complex organizations. This evening, Josh will share some insights into the way two well-known mystics from two very different eras served as prophets of hope in the calamity in the, pardon me, in the calamitous times in which they lived. He will help us to understand better our own calamitous times, how to negotiate them in a new light, and how to transform each of us so we can become bearers of hope to our world. And so now please join me in welcoming Dr. Josh Kenzona. Hi, hello everybody. Um... Thank you so much, Andrew and Kathy. You always give the um, the kindest introductions, and I, I really appreciate it. And uh, it's so nice to see everyone here tonight. Uh, what, what a wonderful opportunity to uh, spend some time together um, and think together about two very important Christian mystics, uh, two very important theologians. Uh, so that said, I'll, I'll go ahead and share my screen, and we'll get started. Uh, so as Kathy said, the, the title tonight is uh, Daunting, uh, Prophets of Hope in Calamitous Times. Uh, daunting first because I call the times calamitous and, and daunting also because I've, I've written quite the tall order for myself. Um, how are we going to talk about both Julian and Tayar uh, within the space of perhaps 45 minutes? Uh, we're going to do our best is, is how we're going to proceed. Here are some goals to, to help guide us. Uh, here's what we're going to do tonight, what we'll be able to do after tonight. Uh, briefly describe the worldview of Tayar and Julian in historical context. Draw connections between the thought of Julian of Norwich and Tayar. And this is, I'll need your help. I, I will make some connections myself. Uh, but please be attentive because you'll draw your own connections. You'll see things that I missed. And um, I hope that you do. And then finally, we'll be able to apply these insights from Julian and Tayar to our present moment, to our own lives. Um, so 
three important goals and uh, three three uh, lenses to to guide us tonight. I'll start with this this idea of a calamitous time, a challenging world. Question I would ask is: Is there are we living in a moment where there is an acute need for hope? Uh, now some. They, they might contest this. They might say, look, Josh, from a, a global perspective, we can look at certain metrics and times are not so bad. Would rather live now than at any other time in history even. And I, I could see that point of view. There's others, you know, I'll say, hey, look, we're living in a challenging moment. And they'll say to me, yeah, that's a non-controversial thesis. Of course, we're living in a challenging moment. Look around. Um, so that's that's the thesis I'm running with. But notice I, I say challenging, not, not the worst ever, not insurmountable, challenging. Why? Uh, I could come up with any number of reasons. Uh, just to point toward a few experiences happening right now. It's climate change. Uh, there's a pandemic. Uh, the economy uh, in the United States and globally is, is struggling. I'm not quite sure what's happening. I wish I knew because then I'd be wealthy. And then um, division, un unprecedented perhaps in America, uh, uh, at least going back to the Civil War, uh, division. And certainly the image is from January 6th. And thinking about this, I, I also wanted to um, just draw some, some quotations some anecdotes. So what I did is I went to an online forum, a message board. Uh, it's called Reddit. Uh, some of you may be familiar, some not. Uh, but it's a space where all kinds of people talk about all kinds of things. Um, however, I would note it tends to skew young and male and individuals more in the tech industry, at least historically, maybe those demographics are shifting. So I pulled just some quotations uh, that I thought capture the sense of a lot of conversation I hear about present times. So climate. One person says, I'm in my late 20s, and in the last couple of years, I realized I want kids. But with the increased effect of global warming, I'm starting to feel like having a kid would just be selfish. The pandemic. Um, one person says, hope for humanity equals decimated. Completely ruined. I used to think I wanted kids. I'm not bringing kids into this world. Uh, presumably, they're thinking about the, the weaknesses in the response to the pandemic. The economy, one person says, I'm just pessimistic about the situation. I dream of having my own home one day, somewhere I can start my own family, but it just seems so far out of reach for ordinary people these days. And then finally about division. I and many of my friends have cut ties with people we'd considered friends just over political beliefs. This is something that is starting to dramatically occur, especially within my generation, Gen Z toward older generations. So uh, not to put us all in a bad mood, but again, I think these are, this is the spirit. These are not uncommon things to hear when I talk to individuals really anywhere, but particularly my age, I'm 40 or, or younger, uh, when thinking about the future and whether or not you know, we're on a good trajectory or a bad one uh, nationally. So that, that's a little bit of context, a little bit of groundwork for why I was thinking about this topic, this topic of, of hope, the need for hope. And from there, I said to myself, well, which, which theologians, which mystics do, do I feel that resonate with me that have the most to say about hope? And my mind immediately went to Julian and Tayar. So what we're going to do this evening is, is look to both of them and consider, you know, what, what does theology have to offer us in a time like this? Uh, so beginning with Julian and her famous quote, all shall be well. Who was Julian? She lived during the 14th century. So from around 1343 to 1416, we don't know exactly. Uh, the image there is an image of... Um, uh, individuals who have died of the plague. More on this in a moment. In fact, uh, we don't even know her name necessarily. It's possible Julian was her given name, 
but it's likely derived from St. Julian's Church, where she lived as an anchoress. Okay, so a good question to ask is what's an anchoress? An anchoress or an anchorite is a person who was withdrawn from the world to live a contemplative life uh, in a cell, like a living space, uh, called an anchor hold. And so there's an image of um, you know, someone entering a consecrated life in, in the anchor hold. Uh, I should pause just a moment to make a note about this. Um, you know, there's two ways to look at the life of an anchoress. And one of my students might say to me, this is a terrible thing <laughs> to wall somebody up in this way. It, it demonstrates a medieval world that is threatened by women's spirituality. Th so threatened that it has to be walled up or walled away. And that, that is one way of looking at things and I think worthy of, of reflection. But I, I would say this also, that if you, if you skew wholly to that point of view, you lose a sense of Julian's own agency to choose her own way of life. And so, you know, to be enclosed as an anchoress, you, you could think of that as a, a cell in a prison sense, but perhaps it's more accurate to think of it like a womb, that it's a place like a birthplace of spiritual insight. The church where she lived uh, has been rebuilt and it has a shrine there honoring Julian. It's an Anglican church you can visit. Um, it was destroyed most especially by the Blitz, so in World War II. And Julian uh, stands out to us now as an exemplar and in her own time as well, that part of being an anchoress is you had these, um, a window where you could speak with visitors. Uh, so that you could share the wisdom and insight that came from your way of life with others. Uh, so again, this kind of um, giving birth. And uh, Julian famously met with Marjorie Kemp, another woman mystic of the time. Uh, so there was this relationship and this sharing in that way, uh, but among mystics as well. And then finally, we're fortunate enough to have um, Julian's writing. She gives to us the revelations of divine love. Uh, there is a short text, and then years later, she wrote a longer text. Uh, this is possibly the first English language work by a woman author. And so this, uh, when referring to her thought and her text, uh, this is the source. Now her time, I call it the calamitous 14th century, which is um, kind of a playful reference to a history book that was quite popular for a time. It's um, uh, titled the calamitous 14th century as a distant mirror, the calamitous 14th century. And why would somebody call it calamitous? Well, uh, it was a time of plague. Um, one person at the time writes, there's a great death in Norwich. I assure you, it's the most universal death I have ever known in England. It's a time of war. There was the Hundred Years' War, and in England also the Peasants' Revolt of 1381, uh, during which Norwich was briefly, briefly captured and then recaptured, um, after which the, the rebel leaders were executed nearby. Um, if, my, if I remember my history co uh, correctly, a bishop was responsible for putting down the rebellion in that region, so... Um, the portfolio of bishop was, was larger in that time than perhaps now. And then finally, schism. Okay. So, you know, you're living in a world of disorder. There's plague, there's war, there's suffering, but it's the Middle Ages, you're a person of faith. Maybe you turn toward the, the church and think, well, here, here I will find a sense of order such that it reflects a divine order. And yet, in the 14th century, there was a schism that produced two, and at one time, even three rival popes. Um, so, so there, too, um, great discord and uh, perhaps anxiety. So this is the time in which Julian is, is writing, and it's important to remember uh, that this is a person who has, has suffered and has witnessed suffering. You know, we, we should reflect on that and take that very seriously as we consider what she has to say. Uh, in the revelations of divine love, she writes toward the beginning that she was 30 and a half years old when she became quite ill. God sent her a bodily sickness. 
And she was so sick um, that she was bedridden and they had a priest come to her to give her last rites. <laughs> And he set up a crucifix so that she could uh, gaze at the at the crucifix and meditate on it. And it was at this time uh, where she was approaching what she thought was her death um, that she received these visions, these revelations, these showings. Uh, she says, it was he himself who showed me this without any intermediary. And when we talk of showing, I mean, some of it seems to have been literal, like a literal vision, um, for instance, initially of the crucifix bleeding. And then other aspects of the showing or the revelation are what was revealed in her in her mind or in her heart. So uh, over time, spiritual insight. Uh, we have the benefit uh, from her book of reading about both. So I'm going to draw out some images and some themes just to give us a sense of, of Julian. First, uh, famously, the hazelnut. She writes, in this vision, he showed a little thing the size of a hazelnut in the palm of my hand. And it was round as a ball. I looked at it with my mind's eye and thought, what can this be? And then she's answered. It is all that is made. And then she says, I wondered how it could last, for it was so small, I thought it might suddenly have disappeared. And then she, she's told, it lasts and will last forever because God loves it. And so you see there my citation from the, from the long text, uh, chapter five. Uh, so first, what's striking about this is the, the immensity, perhaps even we should say the cosmic proportions of the vision that the hazelnut she, she's uh, witness to is all that is made, all created things. And indeed also the fragility of what she is witnessing, that there's a, a fragility to all that is made such that it might disappear. How could it last? And yet she is reassured that it's God's love, which is sustaining all created things. Now remember this when we're talking about Tayar, um, because there's resonance here. Mm. The second theme is this idea of God in all things. She writes, everything which is appropriately done is of God's doing. For it is easy to understand that the best deed is well done, and the lowest deed is done as well as the best and the highest. All are done appropriately and in the order that our Lord has ordained since before time began. For there is no doer but he. And she also um, says, or rather God says, see that I am God. See that I am in everything. See that I do everything. See that I have never stopped ordering my works, nor ever shall eternally. Now, remember what I said earlier about disorder, that if you look in the world around you, you perceive all of this perhaps chaos or disorder, even in God's own church. And yet she is reassured that God is, is there. God is bound up with us. Um, when I talked about the hazelnut, I, I, I said it had cosmic proportions, and yet at the same time, there's this immediacy, this intimacy of God with us, God with our actions, uh, and God with our very being. Uh, in the Quran, there's a, there's a, um, it says that God is closer than our jugular vein. I think Julian would agree with this. And here we have uh, an image of the soul. So remember, God's, God's with us. She says, And then our Lord opened my spiritual eyes and showed me my soul in the middle of my heart. And I saw the soul as large as if it were an endless world and as if it were a holy kingdom. And from the properties I saw in it, I understood that it is a glorious city. In the center of that city sits our Lord Jesus. The Holy Trinity rejoices eternally over the way man's soul is made. So first, I, I am 
fascinated uh, by the way she thinks of space and spatiality, that the cosmic becomes the hazelnut and the intimacy and the immediacy of God in our heart uh, is in fact an entire city. Um, but also here we see another image of the closeness of the divine and another way of saying that it's okay to be human, that our lives and our existence is bound up with God and God's will and God's work and God's love. And so this is the way that Julian sees the world, even in a world where there is so much suffering that she herself has experienced. And that brings us also to um, one of her longer passages, which is a parable of the Lord and the servant. Um, she, she writes, the servant does not just walk, but leaps forward and runs in great haste. Okay, so this is about sin. You might be thinking with everything I said about love and the immediacy of God, and this kind of inner beauty, you might be asking, well, what about sin and sinfulness? So Julian imagines, remember it's the Middle Ages, she, she, she imagines a feudal lord, like a king or a prince, who has a servant. And he says to the servant, here is a message, go, go be my messenger and deliver this to, to um, where I need it to go. And so the servant is eager to, to do this. The, the servant loves his lord. He wants to obey his lord. And so Julian writes, the servant does not just walk, but leaps forward and runs in great haste, in loving anxiety to do his Lord's will. And then he falls. He falls immediately into a slough and is very badly hurt. And so what then? What does the Lord think of this? She writes, and this is how his loving Lord tenderly continued to consider him. Outwardly, he regarded him gently and kindly with great sorrow and pity. You see, it's, it's, the Lord is not angry. He's not mad. This is not wrath. This is not God's wrath. It's God mer God's mercy. This kind Lord said within himself, look at my beloved servant. What injury and distress he has received in my service for love of me. Is it not reasonable that I should compensate him for his terror and his dread, his hurt and his injury? and all of his misery. So the parable is not saying that we will never fall. It's not saying that we will never know, know hurt and, and fear and suffering. What it is saying is that even in the midst of all that, even if we, we think poorly of ourselves and our mistakes, that God will still look on us kindly. And that God is, is, is there with us, maybe most especially with us in moments such as that. And it's often said of Julian that, you know, because of her um, medieval context, uh, that you have to think of this in the sense of, um, again, the prince and the servant, the, the feudalism. That there's a certain way that the prince should treat the prince's subjects that there's a kind of chivalry to it, that there are certain obligations a servant might have to their Lord, but the Lord also has obligations. There's a, there's a right way of being the prince. And it's a way of care and concern and responsibility for those that serve you, that you will keep them, that you will care for them, but that you will keep them well. And so this brings us to, to love. I, I often say that if you're thinking about mysticism and you're thinking about transformation or journey as key themes, you're, you're, you're doing a good job. Keep going. And if you're thinking of mysticism and you're thinking about love, well, then you're, you're, you're exactly right. Julian writes, I saw that for us, he is everything that we find good and comforting. He, God, is our clothing, wrapping us for love, embracing and closing us for tender love so that he can never leave us, being himself everything that is good for us, as I understand it. 
And then toward the end of her writing, she, she has a doubt about her visions and she receives this, who showed you this love? What did he show love? Why did he show it to you for love? And this is how I was taught that our Lord's meaning was love. Love that we might be sustained even in our woundedness. Love, as she famously said, such that all things, all manner of thing shall be well. Okay. Now we'll turn to uh, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, the future is more beautiful than all the pasts. Uh, Teilhard was, was um, very future oriented um, as we shall discover. Who was Teilhard? I, I will answer this only very briefly. Uh, first, we could say he's a soldier, was a soldier. He was born in France in 1881, and thus he served in World War I as a stretcher bearer. So in the trenches, um, even though he was already a priest, uh, he served um, carrying a stretcher. Now, imagine the, the, the anxiety, the fear, um, the absolute um, terror of all that and what he must have seen, uh, you know, courage and bravery and companionship, but also an incredible, incredible amount of, of pain and uh, death. And so I, I often say this of Teilhard, that one of his, one of the critiques that is laid against him is that he's too optimistic that for him to have lived in the age he lived and saw what modernity would, had, had wrought, you know, on the battlefield especially, um, that it's, it's just a naive optimism for him to have, have faith in the future. This is, this is the charge that is sometimes leveled. Um, and, and it's perhaps not a new charge. All mystics, I think, are sometimes accused of thinking too well of humanity. But to that, I would answer this. That when talking of Julian, a woman who lived through plague and war and all kinds of hardship, and when you're talking of Teilhard, a person who literally served in the trenches of World War I, and they tell you that things are going to be okay, that you have to take that seriously. And so that's worth reflecting. He was also a scientist. He made considerable contributions as a geologist and a paleontologist. And his theology is notable for its incorporation of evolutionary theory. Uh, so again, he, you know, he has this, um, I talked about him being forward looking, but he's also past looking. You know, Taylor has a way of seeing through and in cosmic time because of his scientific training. And we'll speak more about this but it's helpful to think of what, what lenses did he use to look at the world around him and to think theologically. Perhaps most importantly, he was a priest. He was a Jesuit priest, deeply influenced by Christian mysticism, which he had first learned uh, reading about mystic saints um, at the knees of his mother. Now, perhaps the calamitous 20th century needs no introduction, but I'll make just a few points. The first is uh, world war. Uh, as uh, one person observed, the lamps are going out all over Europe and we shall not see them lit again in our li lifetime. Totalitarianism, so fascists, dictators, tyrants, and you know, I would say the real fear that this might become the dominant form of government on the planet, that that was a live question. And then finally, the threat of annihilation. Uh, so the, the idea at a species level of an existential threat, either because of total war, genocide, uh, or atomic weaponry.
As we did with Julian, I will draw some themes from Tayar. Uh, the first is seeing. He writes at the beginning of his uh, monograph, The Human Phenomenon, seeing. One could say the whole of life is this, if not ultimately, at least essentially. And then in the Divine Milieu, uh, he writes, I have already accustomed myself to seeing beneath the stillness of that piece of bread, a devouring power, which, in the words of the greatest doctors of your church, far from being consumed by me, consumes me. And so there's this capacity with Teilhard uh, to see, to perceive uh, what others might not be able to. That that's kind of the, the in, in my thinking, the genius of Teilhard as a mystic is his capacity for taking his scientific training and using it to produce a new kind of seeing and then translate that to us. And again, uh, like Julian, it does, it has this, this cosmic immensity as well, because he's able to think in terms of evolutionary time from the beginnings of the universe uh, through um, the evolution of humanity. And so with this, again, this idea of God in all things, he writes, God in all that is most living and incarnate in him is not far away from us. Altogether, apart from the world, we see, touch, hear, smell, and taste about us. Rather, he awaits us every instant in our action, in the work of the moment, there is a sense in which he is at the tip of my pen, my spade, my brush, my needle, of my heart, and of my thought. It is not unlike Julian's city of the soul. It's not unlike Julian's insight that God is in all things and that God is, is the ultimate doer, the ultimate uh, source of action. Teilhard too has this realization that our actions as we work to build the world are bound up with the divine. And it becomes a matter of, of perceiving that reality. It becomes a question of seeing. How, how might we, we best see this reality that already exists? And for Teilhard, this, this uh, idea of God in all things is moving toward the future. He says in the human phenomenon, the way out for the world, the gates of the future, the entry into the superhuman, will not open ahead to some privileged few or to a single people elect among all peoples. They, these gates, they will yield only to the thrust of all together. And so what's, what's key here is that first off, this could be read as profoundly um, inclusive, as profoundly anti-racist, because it, it, it's saying to us that the future is for us, a single people all together. And that um, there, there can be no room for divisions with this. The future is for us all together. So, you know, this idea of, of the privileged few, I think it's an, it's an important observation from Teilhard um, that we have to find or perhaps uncover the reality that there is much more that binds us than, than divides. And indeed, there is a purpose in what we do and there is a future for us, a future for all of us. And so this brings us once again to love, this idea of the binding together. Teilhard writes that considered in its full biological reality, love, the affinity of being with being is not peculiar to man. It is a general property of all life, and as such, it embraces in its varieties and degrees all the forms successfully adopted, successively adopted by organized matter. 
So I, I will offer a brief explanation of Taylor. What, what is he saying here? He is saying that love is a divine force in all things, that the same energy that attracts two people to each other as friends or companions, this is the same energy that draws atoms together to form molecules. That the story of, of creation ongoing is a story of this love energy drawing things forward, drawing things together and forward, um, binding atoms such that uh, they produce planets, a kind of geogenesis of planetary formation. And then upon uh, at least one of those planets, if not many others, uh, a biogenesis such that vegetation and animals uh, come to surround the globe. And then from there, a kind of psychogenesis or the advent, the coming of thought. Uh, and perhaps even onto consciousness, uh, particularly human consciousness is, is what we experience, uh, that we have self-reflective consciousness such that we can now perceive this, this evolutionary process and also perceive our own role in that journey. You know, perceive how we can build the future together. And this may be moving towards something that he called a, a Noah Genesis. He refers to the Noah sphere, which is his understanding that the human self-reflective consciousness may evolve yet still further into a global consciousness. Um, and what is it? that's driving all this, drawing all of this forward, it's love. You know, for Teilhard, what this is moving toward is Christ, what he calls the omega point. And so again, if you think back to Julian, this idea that God is with us even when we stumble, that God is with us in our actions and in our, in our sense of purpose. Remember the messenger. Now, um, I'm going to make just a few comments to draw connections, but um, I hope you've, you've noted some of your own. The first I, I will comment on is seeing, and I'll say this, that some of you may have had the experience uh, where you have a friend, a loved one, a family member, and they're having a, a difficult time. And maybe they are saying, you know, bad things about themselves, right? You know, I've made mistakes, I'm a terrible person, um, and on and on worse than that. And it's it's hard to hear, isn't it, when somebody's saying that about themselves and you care about them, it's, it's hard to hear them talk that way. And you might think, um, you might even say, if you could see yourself the way that I see you, you would not say these terrible things because you would see all that is valuable about you. And you would know that this, this moment of depression is, is it's, it's ultimately a lie because you would see as I see and you would see the truth. And so for me, part of both Julian and Teilhard in different ways is to, is to see that, that truth because they're seeing all of humanity, the individual and the whole in the way that, or at least they're imagining at least, the way that God seeks. You know, what would it mean for us spiritually or in terms of our motivations, our drives, our actions, our thoughts? What would it mean if we could see ourselves the way that God sees us? Seeing for Teilhard and Julian, it's, it's God in all things but it's God also embracing the cosmos, like the hazelnut. God in ourselves, ourselves as God sees us. And for both of them, it's a matter of scale and, and scope. You know, the hazelnut to have all the cosmos in your hand, uh, Teilhard to imagine the entire history of the universe as this divine unfolding. 
uh, for Julian to think of the immediacy and intimacy of God as the Lord looking upon the wounded servant, and for Teilhard to think of that same immediacy in the Eucharist, or even bound up with the energy that holds our atoms together at the, at the microscopic level. With them both, I see a sense of human purpose, that we are building the world together, that God is with us, and with us especially when we stumble. The sense of togetherness, I think, is important. And um, if you draw on the seeing, if you draw on the idea of scale, uh, imagine it this way. You know, at the beginning, I talked about division, that you know, our society seems to have all these terrible divisions, maybe, maybe now worse than ever, some would say. Um, and if you look at the level of your own family, you may see division. And if you look at the level of your town or your city or a school board meeting, you may see terrible division. And if you look at the level of the nation, you may see division. But Teilhard and Julian both are calling on us to at least imagine for a moment, what if we looked from a further vantage point still? What if we could draw back further than family, than city, than nation, to globe or universe or all created things and what if you could see all of humanity from there? Would you still see division or would it seem as if we are all one, one purpose, one unity, one perhaps love? Would it look differently then? And I think this, again, is an important mystic insight that you see in, 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 in numerous mystical theologians that this idea of division and separation, it's an illusion. That the unity is more powerful still because love is more powerful still. And so that's the third theme. In building the world, we are also developing our own selves. Why? As reflections and extensions of that divine love. So in terms of hope, I do think it is possible to look at both Julian and Tayar and, and, and come away with this message that who we are matters, that what we do matters, and that we are loved and all shall be well. Now, um, I hope, my hope, is that that maybe you're interested, you wanna read some more about Julian and Teilhard. Uh, so I wanted to provide just a few references for further reading. I could come up with many more and I'm, I'm sure um, uh, Kathy and others could as well. But uh, The Revelations of Divine Love is extraordinary, the most powerful of books. I, I strongly recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. And if you have, read it again. Uh, there are many editions. There's a Penguin edition, which I, I quite like. Uh, Oxford Classics has an edition. And the Classics of Western Spirituality, which is an amazing series as a whole, um, they have an edition as well, which I think the title is showings for theirs. I'm not, I think so. If you want to read more about Julian, um, there's an excellent book called Julian of Norwich, Theologian, um, from Dennis Turner at Yale. And then um, if you wanna watch a documentary that I, I found quite interesting, uh, it's free on YouTube. It's called BBC, The Search for the Lost Manuscript, Julian of Norwich. So uh, if you search that, it, it, will, um, it will come up for you and you can watch uh, the whole hour long documentary. It's about um, uh, the tracing of her manuscripts, kind of the provenance of them and how, um, uh, they came to, to be rediscovered, essentially. Uh, if I recall correctly, part of that story is that women religious preserved her manuscripts when they fled the English Reformation to the continent. So fascinating. With Teilhard, I recommend The Divine Milieu as an introduction to his um, spiritual thinking. And then uh, Spirit of Fire from Ursula King 
which is a biography, but she she talks quite a bit about his thought as well. Oh yes, recently I read uh, just one more one more book to mention, uh, the Book of Hope by Jane Goodall and Douglas Abrams. Uh, so in this book, they 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 start with the same premise we did that um, we're in a time that needs signs of hope. And uh, Jane Goodall describes what gives her hope, um, including the resilience of nature, um, the activities of youth who are trying to volunteer and make the world a better place. Uh, Jane Goodall has read Tayar and she cites him at different times. Uh, so she, she's a, uh, she is a Tayardian too. Uh, if you'd like to read a book review, I, I wrote one in the last issue of TR Perspective, the uh, newsletter for the TR Association. All right, I know we have some time set aside for conversation. Uh, I, I just wanted to give you a few prompts, some ideas for um, what you might talk about, some questions. You, you need not uh, uh, talk just about this. I just wanted to, to help you. Um, the first is maybe hope. Where do you see signs of hope in the current moment? Uh, or perhaps going back to our goals, uh, connection. Do you see connections between Julian and Tayar? Do you see differences? Uh, resonance, is there an insight from Julian or Tayar that particularly resonates with you? And then finally, witness, what can we do to carry the message of hope forward in the world? So I, I hope that those are helpful. And with that, um, I thank you once again uh, for, for listening. Uh, it's been a pleasure. So thank you very much, Josh, for that beautiful, very beautiful um, presentation. Uh, the lovely images that went with it and uh, the depth of your, your presentation, it, it, it was very moving to me and I hope to others also. Our first question, Josh, is who would you name as a modern day mystic in the form of Julian and Teilhard? What a terrific question that I don't know the answer to. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, in some ways, I think there are many, right? I mean, I feel um, I've sometimes said that Teilhard is a mystic in the way um, of all Jesuits. And, and so I feel that um, yeah, I, I'll give some answer, and then and then maybe somebody can help me give you know even more answer. But what I would say first off is um, following on Bernard McGinn, uh, who is the great you know per perhaps like the greatest living scholar of mysticism, Christian mysticism. Um, I would say that mysticism is for everyone. So there is nothing you know, you know mysticism is um, it's described in different ways. But to me, it's it's just a particular commitment to a relationship with God and a particular commitment to um, Christian spirituality um, that is not you know inaccessible. And so there there may be something for for all of us in mysticism. And so um, if I can get away with being cute, I might say maybe it's you. But um, I, I don't. If, if Andrew or Kathy, if you want to name some names. Um... Josh, that's an awesome answer. I, you know, uh, would just affirm what you said in terms of we're all mystics on some level. And um, it's just learning how to cultivate that, how to express it. But we've got some great responses in the chat, actually. Mm -hmm. um, Sarah from Winslow, uh, dropping some heavy hitters to start with. That Terrence McKenna, <laughs> for one, who I'm a huge mm -hmm. fan of. Um, and he was familiar with Teilhard too and his philosophy, but uh, Thomas Berry, Brian Swim, Bernadette Roberts, Rudolf Steiner, Daniel Andrev. So um, really extending beyond just even, um, you know, the Christian tradition in a sense, which is interesting to include some modern day thinkers, writers, um, people who, you know, read the signs of the times and cultivate hope. Here's another one from Josh. Yeah, I I have an interest in Islam, and Omid Safi is, um, he studies Islamic mysticism, has wonderful podcasts on this topic. Uh, recommend him highly. Mm. 
Yeah, I think there's a lot of like independent media voices that have risen too with podcasts that have given uh, voice to people who are doing interesting things in the world and they maybe aren't getting recognized, you know, with traditional media and things like that, that have charitable organizations that are doing really neat work. Um, addressing issues that are getting underplayed um, on the bigger stage. So, yeah, it's kind of like, um, I think, you know, it's think about what you're into and what you can really nerd out about and go down, you know, those roads. And you can probably think of people within that field. Jane Goodall, for example, you're talking about earlier, you know, mm -hmm. people like that. So, but let's, uh, let's get another question up here um, in the chat from our audience and see if, um, if it's easier, maybe for some folks, I guess we could go with the raising of a hand. I want to use the raise hand function. I'll do my best to see who has their hand up. So, Josh, I know it was interesting for me to get into Julian and her background. Um, admittedly, um, having studied Christian spirituality myself, she was one who um, I probably read a little bit of, you know, her writing, but didn't get too much in her biography. So mm -hmm. it's interesting to have that in the same way that in studying Teilhard, we learn why he was able to cultivate such a sense of hope and promise in the future, um, despite having lived through such a dark and trying time. Um, Pope Francis, here's another one. Um, yes, definitely um, a person who uh, embodies that spirit of hope. Uh, here we go. Uh, question. Do you think that all will be well, uh, saying traditionally attributed to Julian, mm -hmm. is apocalyptic? Well, it, it depends on what we mean by apocalyptic. Um, I think that it, it means that... Um, you know, there, there is, I think it aligns, there's a, there's a moment where Julian says that her, her revelations and everything, her insight aligns fully with the teachings of Holy Church, I think is how she, she phrases it. Uh, but what I, I would say is that part of her hope and part of her vision is, is sort of the Christian promise of the kingdom of heaven. Um so in some ways, for all to be well, um, maybe this is a cumulative effect, right? That this will come in the fullness of time um, after, you know, what we might call apocalypse, the judgment, the, um, you know, sort of the next stage of existence. Um, some have asked the question, is Julian of, of Norwich a universalist? Um, Meaning that does she believe that that no one hell is empty that everyone is somehow saved? Mm -hmm. um, I think all mystics have struggled with this because you know there's this tension between God's wrath and God's mercy in any theological thinking, and mysticism has a tendency to to put all of the energy toward God's mercy, and so it becomes very difficult indeed to think how can there be a hell at all? Um, I, I have no you know. I don't know if there's a final answer on this question, but what I can say is that in Julian's um, way of seeing what she saw was mercy and love. And we have a question in here um, too about that love in terms of, would you speak about love as the energizing force of the universe? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I think um, in, in the Teilhardian sense, again, there, there's this idea that um, for, for Teilhard, the, the definition of love includes the, the energy that holds atoms together. Uh, and it also includes, uh, um, I was talking with Kathy earlier about this Teilhardian notion of the zest for life. Mm. So this, this um, desire to, to lean in and to find ways to unite with other people to to exercise our unique gifts because you know we're being called to build up the earth as well that that's part of what it means to be human is to discover these capacities and employ them as best we may mm -hmm. um, and for Tayar the the drive there this it's, it's a drive but also a pulling forward which is which is love that is, it's it's God's love that sustains all this and and draws it toward um, again something in in some ways apocalyptic, and a mega point, you know, a, a, another sort of stage. Um, so I, I hope that 
helps some, but but Tayar um, is is famously complex, and um, I, I would encourage reading more Tayar because I you know I always learn something new. Josh, this is a question that came out of my small group um, I was in, but it was in regard to suffering and how Tayard remained hopeful, how Julian remained hopeful um, despite the suffering in their own lives, the suffering they witnessed, and moreover, the suffering that exists outside in the world, both in their times, but also in the world today, specifically in the world today. I'm sorry, Andrew. The, the question: How? How? Oh, so in terms to... of that being a question, you know, how did they cultivate hope despite that suffering? I think it, you know. I think with difficulty at times, with, with challenging, you know that. Um, but I think also that it goes back to this question of seeing that if things. Well, I'll say two things. First, um, there's a sense of movement and purpose and activity and it brings to mind the what the quote that's attributed to churchill sometimes that if you're going through hell keep going mm -hmm. and so there's this activity but there's also the 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 seeing that if things look bleak and um you're despondent and you find yourself in despair is there a way that you could adjust your, your way of perceiving, your way of seeing to maybe reframe or to look at things differently. Mm -hmm. And so this was what I was talking about with this idea of scaling further and further back um, to look at humanity from different vantage points and consider maybe, maybe there's a way to reconceptualize so it doesn't seem as bad as it does in, in this one present moment in the fullness of time or in the fullness of this, this kind of mystical spatiality that they're able to engage. Uh, maybe in that context or through that lens, things might seem different and you can find this, this kind of spark for hope. You can find this way of, of re-energizing your own sense of purpose so that you too can keep going. Beautifully said, Josh. Yeah. Hopefully that speaks to the conversation that unfortunately we couldn't get too deeply into in the group discussion uh, because of the time constraints. However, Claire has had her hand up. So let's go to Claire Rusowitz. Thank you. Um, I guess when I was thinking about when you were sort of comparing these calamitous times, which, are, you know, it's a hard thing to do. How do you compare calamities? But I, I keep feeling in this day and age that climate change is something very different in a very different category. And Teilhard was a scientist. You know, he was a mystical scientist. And I'm, and I was thinking a, a lot about it tonight, wonder how his, how his, if he was alive today, how his experience and seeing climate change his understanding as a scientist, because this isn't, you know, we're not looking at something and said, oh, this might be the end of the world. This might be, you know, we're, we're in pretty bad shape, you know, um, in the, in the, you know, in the language of the sixth extinction coming. So just any thought about if the global climate change could even be a tipping point for someone like Tayard but precisely because he's also a scientist, you know? So just any thought on that? I mean, I know there's no real answer to this, but just your thought, any, anything. Yeah, I mean, that's a, a really great question. And I think you are right that, um, you know, that there is something that feels different about this existential threat to the future of the planet, the future of humanity. Um, I don't know what Tayar might have said. I, I think I can think of a variety of responses. Um, but I would say that um, climate change presenting as an existential threat will have a way of asserting itself. I know that now there are those who debate it and, and um, push back against the reality of the situation we find ourselves in. But ultimately, it will assert itself. And what I would hope is that more and more individuals will come together, bring their energy together 
in the face of this existential threat to find a way toward change and a way toward um, the future. Um, and that may be possible yet still. And Jane Goodall, for instance, talks about the resiliency of nature. And so maybe there, there's um, a way forward yet. Um, just one more comment about Tayar is um, in a letter he wrote, he's reflecting on the, um, the H-bomb that was, that was developed toward the end of his life. And he says that it is very sad, it is a real shame that all of these brilliant minds, all of these scientists put their, their thinking together for, for warfare. What would it mean if they could take all of this energy and this potential and put it toward love, put it toward a future, you know, toward, in this case, survival? And so I think he, he would see climate change as just the kind of challenge that could, that could bring people together um, and sort of bring humanity a leap forward. I think that's the kind of optimism he would hold. Um, so, you know, that's, that's just some of my thoughts on that, but I think it's an excellent question. Thank you, Josh. Let's go to the Frosts, Frank and Mary. Okay, it's only Frank who's gonna ask this question, I think. <laughs> but, um, Josh, I wanna start off by saying you did a wonderful job uh, mm -hmm. really a pleasure to uh, have you draw the connections between these one of these mystics and the connections of them to the, the calamitous worlds. Um, my, my, my question has to do with the differences between them rather than the similarities because Tayar was somebody who was in love with the world and Julian was somebody who left the world. She's went to a, uh, an anchor hold uh, and stayed out of the world. And he went, and his whole movement was just the opposite direction. Um, is, can you reflect on why going those two different directions could end up in the same place? <laughs> That's a terrific question. I think they ended up in the same place because it ultimately came from the same place that the, the thread of Christian mysticism, um, you know, extends outward from Christ. Um, and, um, you know, so it's no surprise to me that there would be such commonality between the two of them and that they would, they would, you know, wind up with, with a similar insight. Uh, but you raise a really good point about their different ways of life. Um, you know, one, um, you know, in, in an anchor hold and the other, J.R. was famously a world traveler. He's kind of an Indiana Jones theologian. And, and um, yeah, I mean, I think the insight I would, I would draw, derive from that is that if, if God is in all things, uh, then wherever you go, there God is. You know, you need not be a world traveler um, indeed, you can be a different kind of world traveler within an anchor hold. Hmm. Uh, so that might be one one insight I would draw out of it. And then also that um, you know we we all find ourselves with different opportunities and different gifts and different ways of life in front of us. And um, part of the beauty of this is that those different contexts and those different lenses can um, help us to see and translate certain insight in fresh ways, you know, so that speaks to their different ways of life and speaks to their different historical contexts, um, you know, the science of the 20th century and so forth. Um, yeah, I could say more, but I think that's, um, what a great question. Josh, thank you for your responses that are just taking us deeper beyond your presentation now. This is great. Um, someone comments here, there are external journeys and internal journeys, both went on internal journeys. I think right. external journeys can certainly be catalysts for internal journeys, but uh, you know, ultimately the depth and exploration of self is bottomless because the depth and exploration of God is bottomless. It's infinite. So, um, you know, that says something about inspiring hope too. 
perhaps in some way. Uh, but just to touch on some other comments and uh, really some questions I'm trying to go back to here that um, see some people brought up in the chat. Um, someone, um, Eric Frankhauser asked the question is, wasn't it Jesus Christ that said, all will be well to Julian? If so, was she seeing the big picture as you described earlier? Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I mean that right, right. It was it was sort of um, uh, in the study of Islam we talk, in Islam we talk about God's speech in the Quran. It was like this. It was saying God's speech. Um, but what's the question, Andrew? So uh, was it Jesus that said that? Mm -hmm. I believe so. Yes. Okay. So in a way, that quote is attributable then to Jesus. That's right. It's, That's interesting. It's, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like a red letter Bible. <laughs> you could do a red letter um, um, Julian, and and you see some of the some of the um, um, the revelation is is God's direct speech. Um, and I think I highlighted some of that in the in the presentation. But um, it's true of all shall be well. Um, that she's reassured that she has these anxieties, and she she has questions and she has anxieties, and God um, provides answers to her in time. Um, and that's, that's what's so fascinating about her is like, when you think of revelation or showing, there's many different kinds of revelations, many different kinds of showings that she experiences. Mm -hmm. Some of it insight, some of it direct visual, um, uh, presentation, either like in the room with her or in her mind. And if you read it very closely, you can see she's, she too makes these distinctions and it's um, it's fascinating. I held myself back from discussing it in the presentation because I would have talked for thirty minutes just about <laughs> just about this, which I find so very interesting. Thanks for, uh, like I said, Josh, kind of taking us beyond now and opening things up a little bit. Uh, someone asked the question here. Sister Dorothy says, "Would you say that Teilhard and Julian saw the world in sacramental time?" Yes, I. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think that that's part of, um, you know, Teilhard had this vision of the entire sort of cosmos as Eucharist, that, um, you know, both of them have a way of thinking in sacramental terms, whether it's time or again, space. Um, but but it, it brings to mind some of these key themes, this, this idea of God in everything, this guy, this idea of um a kind of uh, transformation or transubstantiation transubstant of all things. And that um, if you see the world and experience the world in this way, then once again, it, it means that there's something very special about us as well. Mm -hmm. um, I'm trying to go here to a question I saw earlier where it said something about prayer and says, Oh, here it is from Donald Rogers asks is mysticism. You're talking about seeing things in terms of sacramental time mm -hmm. is mysticism always associated with prayer. I would say that it's always associated with, um, that this goes for both the Christian and Islamic traditions that I'm most familiar with, that it's always associated with a kind of, um, closeness with God. Mm. Um, and a, a yearning for the divine, um, you know, from, from the heart. And uh, oftentimes it, it seems perhaps almost exclusively, if, if not exclusively, you know, that that yearning leads toward uh, prayer. And maybe the yearning itself is prayer, even if you're not giving it um, some traditional form. Um, but there's a, a line, I think, in Rumi that talks about um, being human is like being a reed that's that's calling out like a flute that's calling out for um uh to once to once again be joined with god that there's this sort of um uh this, this longing this desire sometimes described even erotically but this desire for for the divine mm. um, and you see this in, in julian as well there, there was some passage that made me think of rumi for for just that reason very nice. Thank you. Yeah, that's certainly helpful in terms of um, you know, seeing it beyond just the Christian tradition as well, I think is helpful when we're reading Teilhard, because I've found that individuals are drawn to Teilhard that are that come from areas that you wouldn't 
fine, um, you know, uh, traditional Christian mind or background, perhaps. So it's interesting, and it's a testament to him and to his vision. Um, we even have a comment here I saw, I thought it was interesting, um, from Sarah from Winslow, who says, according to Ether and Orthodox tradition, hell was emptied on Holy Saturday, Christ harrowed hell. Uh, so it's speaking to that uh, perhaps more perpetual consciousness of that presence of God with us um, as explored through that tradition. Um, so, uh, yeah, and I, I know that, um, you know, Terod himself was partial to the Eastern fathers and the way they saw God's presence and God's hand unfolding within creation. Yeah. So, um, you know, he himself was not limited in his own influence in that too. Think about his influence in the war, his travels, his friendships that extended all beyond um, not just his nationality, but his uh, his faith tradition, his culture. He was a very uh, Renaissance person in that way and attributed hopefully to this vision of hope where he was able to see it in not just his own country or corner of the world, but I would assume no matter where he went. Mm -hmm. You know, he had, he had an incredibly curious mind, right? I mean, he read voraciously and traveled all over. Um, as far as I can tell from his biography, he had a great love of meeting all different kinds of people, mm -hmm. conversation. Uh, there, there's this, I don't know, I want to say fiery. Everything with Tayar is fiery. But this, mm -hmm. this intellectual curiosity uh, with Tayar. And um, maybe that's part of hope, too, is, is to find, you know, Hope to me seems linked very closely with creativity, but also with curiosity that you maintain your intellectual and maybe even spiritual or emotional curiosity about the world around you that you keep trying to see, you keep changing perspective, um, and that that keeps you, keeps you moving uh, forward. And there's something there for you know, all of us you know, in terms of living a good life, a successful life. Um, and I think you see this with Julian as well. Um, she describes herself, I believe, as a, she says, I'm a simple, unlettered creature, and then goes on to produce one of the most beautiful uh, works of literature um, in, in the English language. Um, uh, I, you know, it's testimony to, I mean, it's, it's humility, but it's also maybe perhaps a way that she was trying to navigate around church officials by here are the things that I want to say, but I'm going to take a step back from them. Mm -hmm. She she was very courage, courageous in threading a pathway that allowed her to share her insight with us still today, um, even though there, there, there perhaps was some risk in doing that in the Middle Ages um, as a woman. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josh, for your time, your insight, your wisdom, your willingness to explore tonight with us with these questions. Um, really grateful for a wonderful and rich presentation. A lot to think about beyond just this time together. Oh, thank you, Andrew. And, and thank you all so much. I've, I've greatly enjoyed this and the questions were challenging, but a great deal of fun. And it's been a, it's been a true pleasure. I, I wish you all good things. So now Sister Kathy, um, we'd like to turn it over to you to give some final words and thanks here. Yes, I do want to thank everyone for coming. And especially thank Josh for a wonderful, wonderful talk. I think we'll be thinking about what you've been saying for quite a while. And um, I'm glad the uh, conversations in the uh, small groups went well. And thank you for and to Andrew and Mary and Frank Frost too for, for the technical help. 